chapstick. Today, we're talking about central lines, guys. So we're having fun today, so this might be a little off kind of lecture. So, or you might hear medical students laughing in the background, so I apologize ahead of time. But anyway, today we're talking about central lines. Central line is a way that we get an IV into somebody that we can do a little bit of, a little bit more. Uh, peripheral IV, stick it in your arm, stick it in your hand, uh, you can stick it in your leg. That's one way to get peripheral access. The good thing about peripheral access is it's pretty easy to do. The bad thing about peripheral access is it's very fragile. If you move, they'll fall out. You can't put good stuff through it. Can't put a lot of stuff through it sometimes. Um, so we try not to use it for complicated medical issues. Now, if you come in, a little dehydration, you're gonna get some pain medication, a little bit of IV fluids, some antibiotics, seven days, perfect. If you're in the hospital longer than seven days, you gotta start thinking about long-term access. So. Short term versus long term. Now, from a trauma standpoint, and we talked about this in the other lecture, if someone comes into the emergency room and you need IV access quick, that's reliable, that you can give a lot of fluids, we always start with an antecubital 18 gauge IV. Both antecubitals, you can get two liters of fluid in and pretty quickly, they're short IVs, you can give a lot of fluid, you can bolus it, it works. Peripheral IVs are also better for central access if you're doing CT scans and MRIs. You have to have what's called a power port or something that can be power injected if you're going to do contrast injected studies. Um, peripheral IVs, because it's shorter, they can, they can tolerate a little more pressure versus a long one, not so much, but we'll talk about some of that other stuff down the line when we do just general lines or something. But from a central line access, it really just means one thing. It's placed in a large vein to give fluids, blood, and medications. Now, when we talk about central, we're talking about your internal jugulars, bilaterally, subclavians, um, enter into superior vena cava, and then your femorals that enter into your inferior vena cava and eventually drain into the heart. This ability to go directly into a large vessel is one of the reasons that we can give a lot of different medications. You can give TPN, you can give blood a lot more, uh, a, little, a lot less traumatically than if you're putting it through a peripheral. You can give uh, a host of medicines easier. Downside, infections. Anytime you're putting a large catheter into a large vein, you're more likely to get an infection centrally and that can be a problem. A central infection ends up with vegetations on your heart, end up with spiking fever, you can get sepsis, you can develop fungemia, which is fungus in your blood. So those are some of the downsides of a central line. But given the option, if I have a patient that's sick, do I want a peripheral IV? I want a central IV, I want a central IV because I have more choices. Up until 1954, probably to 54 to 75, this was a pain in the butt because we didn't have a good technique to be able to do this. So these patients either you had to guess exactly where the vein was and stick a big needle in there and hope that it worked, or um, we had to do what's called a cut down where we actually cut down directly to the vein and put the catheter in. There's a gentleman that developed something called the Seldinger Technique. The Seldinger Technique is what has revolutionized not only just ICU care, but also interventional cardiology, um, interventional radiology. Anything that you do from an interventional vein or artery standpoint is based on this technique. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, I have a bunch of videos that are posted on YouTube and Instagram that talk about how it works and everything. But pre this, we literally had to look at the vein, make sure that we not go through it, and put an IV in. You can understand that something like uh, putting in a central venous line at the bedside that can take anywhere from 
two minutes if you need to, to 10 minutes. This was take someone to the operating room, 15 minutes once you were prepped. So you're talking about another 30, 40 minutes to get ready, another 30, 40 minutes to recover. So this was a complex thing versus now we take a little small needle, access the vein, usually under ultrasound guidance, place a wire through it, a guide wire, and then you can upsize to whatever cannula that you need, whether you're putting in a central line or you're eventually going to put in a cardiac stent or put in an abdominal aortic aneurysm stent. You can all do that as opposed to pre this, you had to do it via direct visualization. Now, as far as central lines go, there are Hickman's, pick lines, permacaths, um, perm, uh, vas caths. There are uh, large IVs, double lumens. There are cortis. There are PA catheters. They all kind of have in common the Selinger technique and there is, they are in a vein usually. Arterial lines are a little different, so we're really talking about venous lines. Now, a pick line, they all, they all are different because there's some different uses or whatever. Pick lines are peripherally inserted, which means they usually are hanging out of the arm or the upper arm in the antecubital fossa, but they're very long catheters. Even though that their insertion site is here, they may enter and travel very far to the superior vena cava. The reason a pick line is a good idea is because one of the reasons people get infections in central lines um, is because of the distance between the vein. So if you enter here versus way over here, you have 30, 40 centimeters, almost two feet from where you're messing with it versus the medicine comes out. Versus when you put a pick line and they call them midlines now that only go here, these have a little higher risk of infection. So if it's a short line, it typically is in for seven days. So central lines, anything short, midlines are usually in for seven days unless they are tunneled or a pick line that is very long and a pick line can stay in for 30 days to anywhere longer depending on how long you need it and what you need it for. A CICC line is something new that Christine came up with. I didn't know it was a real thing, but it really just means central venous line. Um, and that's usually the triple lumen catheter that we always put in in the ICU, put it in the emergency room if necessary. A implanted device is a metaport. That is something that we primarily use for chemotherapy. A pick line is a very long line. A central line is a shorter line but usually is put directly into the jugular vein or the subclavian. A implanted device like a port, which is also here, a port, those are put in in one spot, tunneled up to a vein, and then put in the vein. Those typically are underneath the skin so you can't see them. You have to access them with a needle that is specifically designed to go in the port and not cut a hole in it. So you can't just stick a regular needle in to a port or an implanted device. You have to have a specific needle and I'll show you a good example um, of what that needle looks like. Now, when we're talking about tunneled versus non-tunneled, a tunnel device is something like um, a permacath. Permacath has a little cuff on the end of it, that cuff almost extends the length of that line, but it also extends the life of that line. So the whole problem with a central line is a distance between where the medicine goes in and where the catheter is. So short lines have shorter half-lives, longer lines have longer half-lives. What we learn is if we do what's called a tunnel catheter, so you would maybe put the catheter in on Sailor Moon's chest, but it doesn't insert up into the internal jugular vein. So you'll see it come out here, go up here, and then go in the vein. If you put a cuff on that, it's almost the same as putting in a pick line that comes all the way over here. 
So that cuff extends the life because it theoretically prevents bacteria from tunneling through the insertion site and getting to the vein. The also, the also, also, the nice part about it is that cuff gets incorporated into the subcutaneous tissues and the cuff prevents the line from moving. So it's a very good long-term IV access issue if you need something that needs to be in for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days versus a non-tunneled, which is basically a central line, it goes directly into the vein. And again, because the distance between where it hits the vein and the insertion site in the skin and where the medicine is given is pretty short, central venous lines and non-tunneled catheters like vas caths, which are used for temporary dialysis, usually last about seven days. If you do some things like um, using antibiotic coated non-tunneled lines or putting a bio patch, which is a patch that covers the insertion site, that will decrease your chance of getting an infection. As far as these centrally inserted lines, pick lines, tunnel versus non-tunneled, they come in single site, single, double, triple lumen. Um, one thing that we kind of didn't list here, and I'll go over a little bit when we talk about PA catheters, is something called a cortis. Um, a cortis is kind of a double lumen, but it has a large bore that you can put a lot of fluids in somebody. We typically use them for PA catheters because you have to put another catheter through it. But if you have somebody really sick and you have to give them a liter every five minutes, maybe less, you can use a cortis and it works perfectly. Now, a little bit about anatomy. <clears throat> Subcla internal jugular, subclavian, femoral. Femoral is the least likely to cause a big problem if you're in a hurry. So a lot of times when people are going um, ACLS protocols or getting a coded, code blue, whatever you want to call it, somebody's dying and you're in the hospital and you got to get an IV in them and it's not a surgeon or an anesthesiologist putting the line in, a lot of times people try for femorals. Femorals are nice because if you get off to the wrong side, outside of hitting an artery, you're not really going to do much damage versus a subclavian. If you get off and don't know what you're doing, you can puncture a lung. Internal jugular, if you really don't know what you're doing, you can puncture a lung. But you also have a carotid artery that's coming pretty close to the heart and it can cause a big hematoma or your esophagus is back there. You can put a hole in somebody's esophagus if you don't know what you're doing. So it's a lot of fun stuff up here in the neck. Femoral, artery, vein, nerve, empty space. Safer. Downside of a femoral line is if you have a well-built person, it is sometimes hard to find the femoral, the femoral vein, and you can have up to four inches, maybe five, maybe six inches of subcutaneous tissue before you get to that. Excuse me one moment. What do you want? Is it spam? Hello, George Crawford. I think I hung up on him. Good. <laughs> now, sorry. So if you have a uh, well-built person and they have six inches of subcutaneous tissue, but the needle that you need to access the vein is six inches long, that's not going to work. Or it's very challenging. Subclavian is the line of choice for surgeons and anesthesiologists that put in a lot of lines. Anybody that puts in a lot of lines and have to put them in quick, we always go subclavian because this anatomy is fixed. So usually it doesn't matter if you're 400 pounds or 40 pounds. This is a pretty reliable line to put in. This became the line of choice because of that until ultrasound became fun. The majority of lines, probably 90% of lines that are put in, are now put in under ultrasound guidance. 
because you can look at the vein directly. Ultrasound is, works well in ephemerals. It's a little challenging in the femorals if somebody's plumping on the chest because somebody's coding, but it works. Subclavian, because it's fixed underneath the bone, you can still see it, but it's tricky, but we don't use them as much in subclavian lines. So a lot of older surgeons, a lot of older docs that always put in lines, they usually always put in subclavians. Downside of a subclavian is because of the angle, if you're putting in some of these tunneled catheters that we've talked about, putting a subclavian large bore catheter puts you at risk for stenosis. So if you get a stenosis in this thing, that causes swelling in this arm. So a internal jugular line, I think, is probably the best line to put in now. You do have infection rates that are a little higher here. They're also pretty high with internal jugulars, and they can be because, especially in comatose patients, and they're drooling, they drool on the thing. But that's where dressing changes and all that come, come into play. That's why they always talk about changing the dressing every three days, bio patch, because if you do appropriate dressing, this is still a better line. I like an internal jugular line because I can use the ultrasound, see it reliably, watch the needle go directly into the vein, and I know it's in the right place. I have decreased chance of developing a stenosis when I'm pulling, putting in tunneled catheters. I have a decreased chance of causing a pneumothorax. I have, it's easier to position because when you go put a line in, you had a patient turn the head to the left or the right, and you're looking at the jugular vein. It's just right there. Versus clavin, you gotta have a patient take their gown off. Um, femoral, they gotta take a lot more off than just their gown sometimes. So it's a lot easier line to access. So it is my go-to now versus when I was training and we didn't have access to the ultrasound all the time, it would be subclavian. So for me, when I think of central venous access, in a patient in the floor, in the um, on the floor, not on the physical floor, but we call it the floor versus the ICU. It's just in a regular general room bed. I go an internal jugular vein first, and then subclavian femoral. If I'm putting in a tunnel catheter for dialysis access, I will go femoral first. If I'm in a code situation, I will go subclavian. As far as the things that you use these lines for. Drug infusion, fluid resuscitation, emergency venous access, central venous pressure monitoring. These are PA catheters. So anytime pulmonary artery catheters. So anytime somebody, we need to know what your fluid status is, whether your volume overloaded, whether your volume underloaded, um, whether or not you're in congestive heart failure because your heart's failing versus your what we call your tank is dry or you don't have enough fluids in your artery to support your central system, a PA catheter is a good catheter to do that. It is put in the same way, but again, it has something that's called a cordis that a cordis you can dump. I've put a liter of fluid in somebody in five minutes. Just sit there and squeeze it and it dumps it in. So if somebody is super hypotensive, real sick, they'll come in the ER, gunshot wound to the chest, and they're bleeding in their chest, we'll, the paramedics will put peripheral IVs in, and as soon as they hit the trauma bay, we somebody will say, get the cordis. Somebody goes get the cordis, put it in, and you can just start dumping blood, fluids. You can get a lot of stuff into people and watch them blow up like a balloon almost from IV fluids using that thing. So it's an impressive line. But it's a big boy, it only has two ports, so it's, a, it's limited once you get onto the floor and you have to change it out once you're stable, but it's a good line. As far as all of these line options, it gets a little tricky. You got to decide why you're putting the line in, what medicines you're going to put through it, how long you're going to use those medicines for, are there interactions with other medicines, or is this a line that only one service is going to use versus several services are going to use? Does this person have a previous history of cancer and they have a, they have a port on one side 
and they need to do TPN. So there are a host of considerations. Now, duration of access. So short term versus long term. In my mind, the midterm, which I always hated in school, is useless. So what I always do is I go with seven days. So seven days is my cutoff. So if you're gonna be in the hospital longer than seven days, or you're gonna need IV therapy for longer than seven days, you probably need a pick line. If you are here short term, four or five days, and you have bad peripheral IV access, a central line or triple lumen catheter is a good option. So TLC, which is triple lumen catheter, or the learning channel, if you got a show called Stuck, versus a uh, pick line. Okay? Now, if you are doing any complex osmolarity type stuff, pH stuff, you're giving pressors. Pressors, whether it's dopamine, dobutamine, you probably can get away with dopamine, but outside of dopamine, dobutamine, epinephrine, neosinephrine, phenylsinephrine, all, all of those should be put through a central line and not a peripheral line. So if you're giving someone epinephrine, it does not go through a peripheral line because it will necrose the skin and the vein and I will end up having to get consulted because I've got to cut dermis off or cut an arm off because you're giving them pressors through a peripheral IV. Do not do that. Get central access to do that. Some medicines are also not compatible with other things. So if you're giving blood and you're giving some weird pH antibiotic or you're giving lipids at the same time, there's some contraindications with mixing those because they'll actually fall out uh, and just fall into sediments and cause problems. So then you may need something that has three lumens versus one lumen. So that's when you start thinking about a triple lumen catheter. As far as general patient considerations, again, you know, if the patient has one leg and you're trying to decide between putting it in the femoral artery, I mean femoral vein versus a jugular, I would consider staying away from the extremities that they've had amputations on. A little higher risk of developing clots. Um, if the patient is undergoing dialysis or is planning to undergo dialysis in the future, you may want to consider femoral and not jugular because the jugular veins are ones that they will need to do to put vas caths in or permacaths in until they can get a fistula for dialysis. If you're doing TPN, you absolutely should not be putting that in a port. So if they have chemotherapy and they have a port and you're talking about doing TPN, they need another line that you cannot put TPN through a port. Tell you one more time, you cannot put, you can, but you're going to end up getting it infected. They're going to get fungemia, they end up having to take the port out. Now they don't have access because you've destroyed that, that site versus putting a pick line in. Now, pick teams are always, pick teams are kind of like um, sports cars. They got really good ones and they got really bad pick teams. Really good pick teams will put pick lines in everybody because they understand we're, the reason that we're doing it is because something, this is a better option than something else. Really bad pick teams will complain, oh, we can't do that, why? Because the platelet count's one, one below the normal platelet count. Um, well, they already have a line on the other side, I know that, but I can't use that one, so I need to put a pick line in. Well, we don't want them to go on the same side. It's like, no, they're not on the same side, different side. Well, we don't want them touching. That, that's not a real thing. Um, oh, historic, fallacy. You cannot put a pick line or a central line in somebody that had a mastectomy. Okay, That is not true. It used to be true in the 70s and 80s when we were doing total mastectomies and we were tying off vessels. And the reason they said you can't do it is because those patients not only had lymphedema but they had compromised venous systems and it didn't work. 
Now we do total mastectomies with sentinel lymph nodes, axillary node dissections. We're not doing the same thing. Uh, most of the patients that have had total mastectomies are probably no longer alive. There may be a few that have had them, but a mastectomy, if your question is she had a mastectomy on this side and you need to get central access and this side is the best side, then that's the side you go to. If they have a pacemaker on this side, mastectomy on this side, you're going on the side with a mastectomy. You can draw blood from it. You can take blood pressures from it. That is no longer a thing. Old school, not real. So when a nurse tells you we can't, it's not really true. You can't. When a doctor says absolutely not, they don't quite get the anatomy. So yeah, it's not true anymore. Now, why not put a central line in everybody? Why not just say, hey, okay, as soon as you walk through the door, you get a central line because there are complications with them. Again, early in someone's treatment, you don't know if they need one lumen, two lumens, three lumens. You don't know if they're going to be there for 20 days or two days. So we like to figure out what's wrong with somebody first. So that's the one, that's the first reason. Two, <coughs> with long-term IV access, such as a central line, you run the risk of funky infections, bacteremia. So there's a large number of people that get line sepsis from central lines that are left in too long, that are not properly dressed, they're not putting bio patches on at the time they're inserted. Um, some people are not using sterile technique when they put them in. In those situations, you can get sepsis from this. And almost one third of patients that are admitted to the hospital in the United States will develop sepsis at some point. So being able to mitigate that risk is important. So that's why we usually try to get away with a peripheral IV until we get someone uh, stabilized or figure out that they're going to need antibiotics for 14 days, then we put a pick line in. Other things, femoral is associated with the highest risk of infection. And again, nasty groin, nobody's taking a bath um, as often as they should in a hospital. It's a moist, dark area, so you're likely to get infections. So that's why we, again, try to stay away from a femoral line or in a code situation, put the femoral line in, then turn around once they get stabilized, change them out to a pick line or a jugular IV access. The most common infection for a central line is a gram positive rod. Makes sense. Yeah, gram positive, not gram positive rod, gram positive, any type of gram positive bacteria. The main reason it's because it's skin floor. You put a hole in the skin, you put a, a direct connection between a healthy amount of blood and skin, you're gonna get infections. You leave them in too long, they're gonna get infected. Gram positive bacteremia is not the worst complication. The worst complication is fungemia. So you get a fungal infection, that's a whole different ball game. That changes pretty much every management that you're doing with a patient. So we try to avoid that. So that's another reason that we just don't put central lines in everybody. I will put a couple of videos up about central lines, how to put in a pick line, how to, well, no, I won't do pick lines. There's thousands of those. We'll do how to put in a central line and we'll put a how, how to put in a dialysis catheter and how to put in a port. Those are pretty much the three most common lines that we put in surgery today. Hope this answers your questions. If you have any, let me know. Again, sum up is central lines are good when used in the right situation. They are also very dangerous if they're not put in correctly or in the wrong situation. Let me record the question. You got any? I mean, you're not forced to ask, answer questions. No, you answered my answer between the pick and central, okay. how long they are. Okay. You good? You good? You're no questions? Okay. There we go. Easy enough. Pardon? <laughs> 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 Ain't nothing wrong with thunder when the rain. <laughs>